song? Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah. Great, I'm gonna present in English, so I'll try and speak as slow as I can, so hopefully everyone can understand me. I've been told that sometimes I speak too quickly, so <laughs> I'll try and uh, slow it down. My name is Eric Basic. I work at the Sensible Cities Lab at MIT. It's in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and what it is is a multidisciplinary group that looks at the city and the way that digital technologies are affecting the way that we understand and navigate uh, the city and how that's changing our experience of the urban realm. It's a multidisciplinary group made up of architects, engineers, um, software designers, computer programmers, um, social scientists, people coming from a wide range of backgrounds to kind of solve this difficult problem. Um, so this may seem like a funny slide to, uh, to start a presentation on cities about, but actually there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between Formula One race cars and how they've evolved over the last few decades and how cities have also evolved over the last few decades. Um, what makes this car faster and more efficient than any of before it is also it has to do with the aerodynamic shape and the engine, but the biggest revolution has been in the sensor technology that is embedded in these cars. Each one of these cars has literally thousands of sensors embedded throughout the engine uh, and the bodywork that relay information constantly to a control center, much like this. This information comes in, is processed, and then information is sent back to the car and driver to help it make slight modifications to improve performance and optimize um, functioning of the system. And that's much like what's happening in cities today. It's this constant cycle of sensing and actuation. When information's coming in, decisions are made, and then response. So in the last few decades, we've had um, really a digital revolution across cities. Cities are essentially now blanketed sensing technology, as we already heard today with the um, gunshot sensing. They have little microphones all over the city. There's cameras everywhere, CCTV, even phones. Everyone has a phone in their pocket, which acts as like a mobile sensor. So we have all this additional information. What can we do? And we're able to now understand the city in a way that we've never seen before. So why are cities important? I kind of keep the slide to help me remember why it's relevant. Cities occupy about 2% of the Earth's surface but now in habit, more than 50% of the population lives in urban areas. Um, these areas use about 75% of the world's energy and are responsible for nearly 80% of total carbon emissions. So even small modifications or improvements that we can make in the performance of cities can have massive repercussions at a global scale for global ecology. So I'm going to go over um, a few projects that our lab has been working on in the last few years that demonstrate sensing and actuating in urban spaces. Um, the first one was first exhibited at the Venice Biennale in 2006. Um, and what we used was anonymized, <laughs> anonymized um, aggregated data to kind of understand the way people are moving in a city. And we chose the World Cup final in 2006 between um, France and Italy. Brazil didn't make that one. So you may remember it was the, uh, the famous the Dan headbutt um, one, and so we're just um, trying to understand the dynamics of how people are moving in the city, just looking at cell phone data. So here's a map of Rome. You can see the Colosseum in the middle, the River Tibre, and this is the day of the match before um, kickoff time. So this is the regular cell phone data activity happening in the network. You can see people making calls, businesses, and where they are geolocated geo throughout the area. This is the, before the match, there's a lot of anticipation starting, and then once the game begins, it goes silent because everyone's watching the matches, no one on their cell phone. Half time, people make some quick calls. Second half begins, and in normal time, there's the overtime, and Zidane headbutt, <laughs> Italy wins, and the crowd goes crazy, and everyone leaves the stadium and goes out to party. So that's, that's an example of the way we can use the sensing technology to see the city in a way that we've never seen it before. Um, but on top of sensing people, you know, through cell phone networks, we can also track um, things and objects in the city. And this is what this project looked at. Um, it seems that we know so much about the supply chain. Everyone knows where their goods come from. This map shows um, all the components in a MacBook Pro, kind of like my computer here, where they all come from from around the world to be assembled and to make this computer. So we're very knowledgeable on where things come from, but we're much less knowledgeable on where things go after the end of their useful life. So we came up with this project called Trash Track, where we um, took RFID tags and put them on pieces of garbage and let them out to the waste stream to see where they went. Um, this is what we found. Oh, there should be audio with this. Okay. 
So this is just the messy garbage that people in Seattle volunteered for us to throw away for them. <laughs> and we put on their little tags and tracked it, see where it went. 3,000 objects in total. And essentially, they're just like little cell phone RFID tags. This is where all our garbage went after a week. It covered most of the Pacific Northwest of the United States. <coughs> after two weeks, it expanded across the entire country. Some of it zigzagging back all the way from the East Coast back to the West Coast again. And after a month, two months, things like batteries, um, cell phone parts were still moving across the country. Plus two months, still moving. So, this was really surprising to a lot of people because it's easy to just throw away your trash, put it in the bin, and that's the end of your relationship with it. But the actual life of these objects persists much longer. Um, I'm going to look at a couple other projects now that deal with actuating in the built environment. Um, this is a project uh, that we looked at in Zaragoza in 2008 for the World Expo. And the mayor came to us and he suggested that we look at a way that digital technologies could be introduced to the uh, Mediterranean tradition of water and fountains in public spaces. So we took this idea to the lab and uh, suggested that we have a pipe full of water and then have little valves controlling the water stream, kind of create a water curtain. And that by digitally controlling um, the valves, we could create text and images and openings within the water stream. And then even it could respond to you when you arrive to open for you. And it's called the Digital Water Pavilion in Zaragoza. And this is kind of a short video walking you through it. So there's no doors or windows in this pavilion, but it senses when you arrive and the water flow stops to let you in. And the whole building was covered in water, even on the roof. And in conditions where maybe the wind picked up a little bit and you started getting too much spray coming in, um, it was able to be lower. Kind of, again, responding to the environment. And it would be completely collapsed, essentially dematerializing the architecture. This is a photograph of uh, it in operation. Some kind of confused looking bystander, trying to understand what's going on. Um, this is Carlo testing it out, and I'll be honest with you, there was some problems with the sensors, and um, of course they stopped working at one point. But that actually turned out alright, because these kids <laughs> had a lot of fun trying to get in and out of the pavilion without getting wet. So it kind of changed the dynamic of the architecture. Which was surprising and, and fun, I think, for everyone involved, so that was great. And, and this project kind of inspired another one. You can see little water droplets coming down, and we projected some images onto that. And that got us thinking about these little droplets being lit with projected light. And we're like, well, what if, if instead of just falling straight down to the ground, if these little lit droplets could fly away? And so that got us thinking about the next project, where we take these little miniature helicopters with LED lights embedded in them and uh, set them free and let them organize in a synchronous way. So the project's called Flyfire. These could be organized spatially in two dimensions to create a folded sheet. Or they can be organized in a voluminous way and just have the light controlling the, um, the action, the activity. So this would create this, essentially a three-dimensional media display that people could interact with and be able to walk through and perceive from all angles. The idea of having a scalable screen that can change in resolution and size is also quite attractive. And it's completely mobile and essentially weightless.
And so these are actually under development right now. We're trying to uh, <laughs> trying to make them uh, fully operable. Right now we have a small fleet of about nine, and I think there's works on one for about 30 of these little devices, and this is kind of where they're at right now, with the controllable light, all each individually identified, and then controlled in, in the air. So this is an idea that kind of approaches um, the notion of unity, the idea of bits and atoms coming together, that digital technology and digital information can actually become physical reality. Um, we're also working on a project in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, there's something a little bit closer to home for you guys that has to do with water and infrastructure in Rio. Um, we're working with the mayor to understand the way that digital technologies can be embedded in infrastructure and how that can improve the efficiency and effectiveness of water services in the city. Um, so Rio gets most of its water from the Pariba do Sol River, <laughs> which, is, which is quite industrialized and quite heavily polluted along the way, and so that creates a lot of problems because the drinking water supply for the city is subject to such industrial pollution. Um, this is an example of it. There's a lot of textile mills, a lot of food processing plants along the way. And this all drains into the Guanabara Bay. And the Guanabara Bay also is quite polluted in its own right due to all the shipping industry that is going on there. Um, this was from last February 2010. I'm not sure if you remember, but there was an algal bloom that happened in the Guanabara Bay and there was I think literally tons of fish that died due to suffocation. The algae consumed all the oxygen in the water and the fish perished. So this kind of raised concern for us that, okay, maybe water is an important issue for Rio. How can we uh, help remedy this wastewater? And even today, I think a lot of beaches in the Rio area aren't suitable for swimming. This is Botafogo Beach. I think a lot of people don't go there just because there's fears of contamination and pollution. So we wanted to address um, this issue and find a way that people could be more safe and more educated in their decisions. These are other beaches around Rio. Um, uh, even in Niteroi, I think, is also a, a concern. So we got this kind of playful <laughs> little device um, that would be a sensor that would exist in the water, a multi-parameter sensor that would take readings on the water quality condition and read them, relay them up to a larger network that people could access. So this is a rough cross-section of what would be in the device. It has um, a real-time mini-lab to, like I said, do the multi-parameter multi sensing um, power converter. And most of the power would be provided on board through a photovoltaic array on the little tentacles and through um, piezoelectric wave attenuators that, as waves pass by, it creates um, electricity. And the LED display would, I said again, would um, indicate what the quality was like of the water, so people from a distance could perceive what, what was happening. This is a little one uh, indicating the water is maybe hazardous, and so you can actually communicate with your cell phone to these devices um, and send them messages, and they can respond back to you, giving you information about the water quality. There's one just a bit closer. And so all this information that could be aggregated by these um, individual elements would create a citywide map that people could access and, and be able to see what the water parameters were like in their neighborhood. And we were hoping that this information would instigate some type of political action by having a better understanding of what the actual conditions were like in their region. People could take it to the newspapers or take it to the government and try to instigate some change in policy or in environmental awareness. So this is an example of like a media display that could be happening right on Ipanema Beach or something that give people an idea of what the quality was like for them there. And it would also be uh, readily accessed on the mobile app as well. And we decided to call it the Lula Project <laughs> for the word squid. I guess it made a bit more sense when, when Lula was in office, but I think um, it's still a catchy name. That's all, thank you very much.